You are listening to a Monash Christian Union Bible Talk. We encourage you to share this with friends and family, but ask that you do not edit it without the permission of the owners. This Bible Talk is designed to supplement belonging to a local church with its teaching and community, not to replace it. We pray this talk helps you love Jesus and become more like him. Hello everyone, Joel here. I thought I'd just jump in to tell you about this podcast. It's our Q&A from our mid-year camp called Summit, uh, which was on the resurrection. That's our mid-year camp for all Monash and Deacon students that we run. Uh, And what you'll hear is that we had all been through a few days worth of looking at what the Bible has to say about resurrection. Um, And so there's quite a few questions that reference, oh, we did this in the seminars, we've talked a lot about this. And what that's referring to is those particular uh, seminars. And so uh, please enjoy all the varied questions, the tricky questions, as Candice and Joash and Stu try and answer them. Um, And if you're a Monash student, we'd love to see you at our next year summit um, as we dive into another topic in the Bible or another theme in the Bible. Um, But please also come and get involved in CU this next semester. Uh, Just a word of warning, the volume does change a fair bit depending on who's talking. Uh, And so hopefully whatever your device you're on and listening to, you can adapt a little bit, but we've tried to smooth it out as much as possible. Um, Thinking deeply about these things and investigating uh, what it means to know and trust uh, Jesus, who he is and what he's done. And we pray, Father, that this question time would be really helpful to each and every one of us. Um, Give us humility, both in our questioning and our answering. Um, Help us to be, um, yeah, uh, thoughtful. Help us to be generous and kind about the assumptions we make about both questions and answers um, and help us to uh, honour you in all that we say um, and think and do. Uh, We pray that you would build us up and encourage us in this time together and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, Might be nice if we have the lights on. Um, I don't know if that's a problem. Um, just so that if people want to flick through their Bibles, they can see. It also means that we can see you guys a little bit better, so that's, that's nice as well. Um, thank you. Thanks for putting the lights on. Um, should introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Candice. I'm one of the staff at Deacon. Um, this is Joash, uh, one of the staff at Monash, and you've all met Stu, also one of the staff at Monash. Um, uh, Joash has had particular involvement in the seminar material. Um, Stu has been giving the talks. Uh, and I get to ask the questions. So um, we'll start with one from the, the box at the back. Um, thinking about what it means to be united to Christ, and particularly what Bible passages can we look to um, to think about that it's through our faith in Christ that we're united to him. Um, so places we can go in the Bible to think about the connection between having faith in Jesus and being united to Jesus. Uh, do you want to kick us off, Josh? Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, so I think in the seminar material, it's been really exciting to see that life cycle of Christ. And, and maybe there's some verses there that kind of go through the different steps that we go through. Um, I believe it was like four new or chosen, um, died, buried, made alive and raised with Christ. So there are a few verses there. You can go back in the booklet. Um, but I, I think one that really strikes me is Romans 6. So if you have your Bibles, it'd be wonderful to open um, them. Um, And we're looking maybe at 6 verse 8, if I could read for us. Um, Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. Um, And there's a sense where you can see this paradigm where because Christ has done something, we believe that we live in him. There are some more verses, that was Romans 6, that you could pour over in more detail. I think Stu just talked about Colossians 3, uh, verses 1 to 4, um, that has that same kind of paradigm that we know we've died and are raised in him. Um, and I think that um, our, our faith in him is, is, is vital to that experience. Uh, another passage that comes to mind is 1 Corinthians 12, 12, which talks about the body of Christ and how we are members of the body. And so I think that's that kind of drawing, do you remember it, that you did in the, in the booklet, where because we're part of the body of Christ, the things that happened to Jesus by account of his resurrection happened to us. Um, yeah, that, that's my early quick answer to that. Do you have any more on that? Or? Ephesians 2, but I think, yeah. are, you, are you 
bunching that together with the Colossians or whatever. Yeah, you go for it, yeah. No, that's it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Ephesians 2 is also... Hint, hint, that's what she says. Oh, um, I don't know what verse it is. That's why it's oh. the verse. Okay. <laughs> you can fill in the verse. Somewhere in there. I think, I think the first half in particular yeah, is yeah, quite helpful. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so about, there's a lot of in Christ language in that passage, and you'll see about the connection of faith and grace and um, being created in Christ Jesus um, in that passage as well. Could I add one yes. more thing? I think one thing that's yes. been really exciting to think about is um, because we know that faith is a gift from God, um, is that our un- union with Christ um, doesn't dissolve. Like we continue in him because he continues that in us. And so we can have assurance um, that he will complete that. And I think that's a really cool thing to think about. So I think that's why Christians can have certainty that we will rise with Christ on, a- on account of our faith. It's, well, our faith itself is a gift from God. Yeah. That's very helpful. I remember I'd been a Christian for quite a while, like longer than it probably took most people to learn it, but um, had this like real deepening understanding, a bit like what we're studying this week on union with Christ. And I just had this like aha moment. And I said to you know the person who was discipling me, helping me to understand, I was like, oh, it's because it's all about what Jesus has done. And I just felt like you've been a Christian for like 10 years. <laughs> um, but it was that's you know that never gets old no, till it's yeah. all about what Jesus has done. We don't mm. um, hold on to it even by ourselves, mm. um, even as He invites us to trust mm. Him and to um, participate in that way. Um, can I ask a question that um, further down the pile, but related? Um, you mentioned that it's God's gift. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about um, kind of the relationship between God's um, election or predestination of us and our kind of choice and will? Mm. Um, Stu can also jump in. Sorry, Joash, yeah, under, under the bus you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. got this. Huh? You know stuff, Joash. You know stuff. <laughs> you don't um, have to give the definitive answer. Yeah, give us yeah. some thoughts. Give us yeah. some thoughts. Yeah, yeah I'm going to solve it right now. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, this is what I'll say right from the beginning um, is that the Christian Union um, is a broadly evangelical group and we're excited about our gospel unity. And we have people who have differences on these views. But I think we can have strong convictions of what the Bible says. And I think we probably all here up front agree. Um, and we're going to present to you what we think the Bible says, I think, quite clearly, which is that by nature of God's nature, his character, that he is sovereign. He created all things. He is eternal. Um, he knows the future. Um, just by nature of his who he is, uh, it just makes sense, doesn't it, that he knows what will happen to all of us. I think there are verses in the Bible, you're thinking of Ephesians 1, um, maybe even Romans 9 um, to 11, which talk about this idea that God chooses us. And um, I think I initially really balked at that idea when I was a student at CU. I I found that very hard to swallow. Um, So many questions come up. Um, but the thing that really helped me to see why I think that God is the one who is, gives the gift and that he's the one who chooses is that, um, of course, faith is a gift of God. When I told my testimony to people, it wasn't like, oh, I did this amazing thing and then I figured it out. No, of course not. He was working in my life in every instance. And so every part of it really was a gift from him. And he orchestrated the whole thing um, he helped me to see. Um, Stu talked about this idea of a, a big bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, which was blind. Uh, sorry, we're blind to see it because of the fog. And, and, and God like, lights up this big spotlight so we can see that bridge. Um, he needed to help me to see the great truths that were obvious. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, there are a few verses in the Bible. Please do have a look at Romans 9 and look at Paul's argument there. And... You, you may uh, have some questions. We'd love to chat to you more about it later. But I do think that God gives gifts, and by nature of that, that means it's of him and not of us. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, <laughs> <that sounds laughs> right. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. That's very helpful. <clears throat> uh, we, will, we will try and kind of focus on resurrection-type questions, given what Summit's about. Um, but where there's a useful tangent, sure. I think yeah. we'll, we'll run with it. Um, I'd love to invite, if there's um, anyone who'd like to ask a question uh, from the floor... Um, your hand was very quick. <laughs> Would you like to 
just jump over to the mic so that uh, people can hear. If you're kind of waiting for... Oh, Dan. Got, sorry. <laughs> there, oh. I think there are people running around with microphones uh, this is too. This Dan, I think, is actually... And then um, there's this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, if you also had your hand up, put your hand up again and Dan will come to you. Yeah. Um, down the front here. Um, but we'll Sean. jump over to your question. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. And, um, uh, I just wanted to ask, like, what is specifically meant by traditional sanctification? Why are we doing this thing? Because I know that this is the thing. Thank you. Um, Stu, you're the one that brought it up. <laughs> oh, I raised it, Stu. So I should answer the question. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, well, I'm a little bit stuck, I think, because, in a way, because I was trying my darndest to explain it in the talk, my bad, but I think it's, so at risk of repeating what I said, as I understand it, positional sanctification is trying to describe that in Christness. That means that we are made holy completely before God, uh, even as we're still in the flesh and obviously still in sin. So because of, by virtue of the fact that we united with Christ. He died our death. Um, he, was, uh, he was resurrected uh, for our resurrection. Um, yeah, so that's positional sanctification. Because of who we are in Christ, we are holy. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I can try and... At a diff, uh, get, come at it from a different angle, but I'm a bit lost for words. I'm getting, yeah. you know. I, was, I was just thinking about um, <clears throat> we're studying Leviticus at my church at the moment, um, which has actually been amazing. So, you know, um, people might feel a bit intimidated. Like I, I read Leviticus sometimes and think, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be taking. But one of the things in Leviticus is there's a lot of um, process and effort about how to be um, in God's presence. Um, how to be the idea of holiness is about being set apart um, some, like holy is a very what does that even mean kind of word but the idea holy sanctified it's about being set apart and so set apart for God and in his presence um, and so I, like in Leviticus there's a whole process you could be just kind of normal like kind of clean you might do things that make you unclean and then you need a process to get clean again um, but to get holy is like another level and so there's this process of becoming in the status of or the position of being set apart for God and able to be with God. Um, so that, I think, is, gives you this idea that there's categories and there's a category that's holy, that's set apart for God. Um, and in the kind of bigger picture, that's a little like image in the Old Testament Le Leviticus as a whole system that's a little illustration to say that we as God's people can be set apart um, for him. And so to say that we're positionally sanctified is that's, that's your status. You're someone who is clean before God, someone who can be in his presence, um, cleansed of sin, all that kind of thing. Um, and you contrasted it before, Stu, to progressive sanctification, is that right? Um, which is more about like, so in Jesus you have your status of being clean and holy and all of that. Um, but you kind of look at your life and you go, oh, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite match. Um, yet the Spirit's working in us and making it match more and more over time. So that's kind of the process, I guess, of progressive sanctification. Hmm. Is that, I don't know. Yep, thank you. That's, yeah. Yeah. I Leviticus. found that helpful. Is that, yeah. is that helpful? Yeah. yeah. We, we can talk more about that if um, it's helpful later. Um, there's a really good question in here about, um, and maybe it relates to what we were talking about before, sometimes the struggle to believe. Mm. Um, what would you kind of advise someone who, you know, there's lots of people here, we're studying the Bible's message, um, we're hearing about the resurrection, maybe they feel they want to believe but just can't, like there's a... Um, it seems unbelievable. Um, here we've got written like an atheist instinct they can't overcome. Like, um, have you guys got any advice for someone who want, seem, like, wants to believe but is just finding it hard? Like it's mm. not happening. Y 
Yeah, so uh, I guess there are two angles on this. One would be um, to hang in there because uh, where else have we to go? Because you alone have words of eternal life. So I think w- one part of it is uh, what's the alternative? Um, so, I mean, look, what it comes down to is you do have to decide to trust in Jesus. I, I can't make that decision for you. Um, that, that, is, that is a decision for you to make, to decide to, to trust in Jesus. And, of course, um, it, it, it's, it's also a spiritual work by the Holy Spirit in your life through his word um, to, to trust in Jesus, like, uh, God gives you faith by his spirit in Jesus, but that doesn't feel very helpful to you if your rest just feels like it's messing with your mind saying that. But the reason I mention that is because, um, uh, yeah, if you seek, you'll find. Like, so pray, pray. Uh, and the, the prayer offered in faith, he will surely answer. Um, so, so, yeah, a couple of angles there. Um, well, just think, like, you've got to trust something or someone. Choose wisely and carefully. Like, where else have we to go? Uh, so that's kind of the negative way of looking at it. Keep praying because it is a spiritual work and God is pleased to answer those prayers. And uh, thirdly, um, yeah, Christ has got this. And um, faith doesn't have to be about... So, so one illustration is, you know, there's, there's a bridge... Um, that you know crosses a, a, a stream that's raging. You've got to cross over it, um, and uh, you're a bit nervous. Um, other people run across it; they're perfectly confident, um, but you're really doubtful. Will the bridge hold? Um, well, it doesn't really matter how much faith you have in that bridge. It's just that you run over it. That is, assuming you need to get to the other side. There's something about that illustration that doesn't work. I should have had like a roaring lion or something, right? So you've got to, you know, you've got to get across the bridge, right? But you're really worried about it. It doesn't really matter how strong or weak your faith in that bridge is. You've, you just, it's just that you, put your, you exercise your faith. You put your faith in it. And so you don't need to get too caught up uh, in how feeble your faith feels or how distant from you God you feel or how weak your faith feels. What matters is that you understand if Jesus rose from the dead, he is a good person to trust, even with your feeble faith. Like he, he, he can deal with that. He can deal with that. He's a good guy to trust with a feeble faith. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so where, where else have you go? Uh, Jesus is trust, transparently trustworthy. If the scriptures are true, he's transparently trustworthy. So just hang in there with him, trust him, um, and pray. Yeah. That's very helpful. Thank you, Stu. Um, question from the floor. Yeah. Hello. Oh, um, I was, my first kind of question is uh, when we were, I, we were talking about it before and I wanted to respond to it with like, the aspect of free will and predestiny, but it's fine if we want to move on. Okay, cool. Um, I think I just don't understand how we can be chosen and then at the same time still have the element of free will and then this idea of like everyone having an equal opportunity of being able to come to Christ does that does that make sense of it can feel when it's described that way that not everyone had like a fair chance if that makes sense yeah so kind of your concern is maybe people have different opportunities to hear the gospel or respond to the gospel yeah so like how how do you grapple with the idea of certain people are chosen and certain people aren't and then what makes them different and then the idea of shouldn't everyone be able to have that choice Mm. yeah yeah um thoughts sorry oh well (laughs) such such a tough one such a tough one and i I mean i really yeah i mean i think any 
Yeah, mm. a lot of Christians have wrestled with that for sure. Um, I'm going to really quickly uh, throw up an answer on that, and I, it, I, I, I don't imagine it'll immediately satisfy you, but um, in my mind, uh, there are four truths, four passages that really help me kind of put pegs in the ground around that issue. Mm. Uh, so, so the first one is, is uh, and you go elsewhere, but you know in Colossians where it talks about everything made by, through, for Jesus, and he, and, he, and he sustains everything too. Like, So the first thing is, uh, if God is God, uh, it's, it's really hard, I guess philosophically, but also scripturally, to conceive of a God who is truly God, who isn't actually, at the end of the day, in control of absolutely everything. Um, and that's exactly what it describes in Colossians. Like when you look at that, you think, well, then what, what isn't under his authority or, or, or rule? So part of the grappling is just the fact that we cannot work out, really, uh, in our minds, how it's possible for there to be a truly God God, an utterly sovereign God, um, and yet us to have, in any sense, free will. Um, it's just not something that makes sense for us at one level. On the other hand, um, yeah, so if, if, if God is God, that makes perfect sense, the, the, the Bible's description of God. Also, philosophically, that makes sense, if God, yeah, for God to, God to be like that. That's kind of the def- definition of God. Um, uh, but uh, we do have uh, free will. We, we, like we are responsible for rejecting God. That's also made really clear. How exactly that works with God's sovereignty and things like predestination, I can't give you a complete answer of how that works together. I just know that they're both there. And it appeals to our will, like turn and repent. That's, that's an appeal to our will. So there is some sort of free will, right? And we are held responsible. So there are two things. They're just both there concurrently, God's sovereignty and our, and our, free, uh, and our freedom of will. Uh, the other thing is, so that's just two pegs. The other peg is um, that God does want all people to be saved. It says that in two Timothy one or two somewhere. Where is it? Two Timothy something. God yeah. wants all people to be saved. I think that's. Yeah. Someone help me. Um, if, you, if you know the oh, reference. Uh, two Timothy two, isn't it? Two Timothy two. What it? Some, yeah, someone will get there. Yeah, so God wants all people to be saved, right? That's another pig in the ground. God does care about every soul. Um, but then in, in Romans 9, where it talks about um, there's this question come up, like how is it fair for some to be saved uh, uh, via God's will, his, his work of predestination and others not to be saved? And there it's a speculation. It's really helpful to read that passage, though. Mm. Two things he, he says really clearly. First, he says, well, God is God and we are not. So let's just work with what we know. Like, we don't quite know how that all works, but just let God be God. But the, but the other thing he says, which I find is really interesting, his speculation is um, that, that this way brings more glory to God. Um, so, you know, what if some not being saved is for the, basically for the purpose of of him being glorified. That's his argument. And, and this is the thing I think that it's helpful to understand about God, is that he's, uh, you know, there, there are competing priorities and his chief priority is that he is glorified. So it, it can be absolutely true that God uh, really does want all people to be saved, but that uh, the most glorifying thing to him is that not all people are saved. So, does that, so there's like four pegs in there, right? They sort, of, sort of help frame that. Does that make sense? Um, we might not be able to continue having it back and forth. Yeah. I wonder if I can encourage you guys to chat later on. Can, can, you, okay? can you guys... I mean, it's, it's a really deep, yeah, hard question, so is. I wanted to give yeah, a bit of a oh, comment yeah, yeah. answer, but yeah. is there anything you can uh, say to... Um, I'll, I'll say one quick thing... Um, 
Yeah, so like Stu, and I, I was mentioning the passage for Romans 9, this is actually a question that is asked and answered in Scripture. So you can look to see what God says about that very question and see yeah, see how he actually, Paul, Paul is trying to actually untangle that question. So you can, you can go and read it yourself and see what's he saying. Um, the, other, the other thing I would say to that is um, uh, the, the, the kind of almost pursuit of free will that we have um, is I think a little bit um, uh, futile because uh, if we look to other systems, right? So we look at the sovereign God and we go, well, we can't have total free will in that. Um, there actually aren't any other systems of thought that actually offer free will either. So even if we don't have a God and we have some sort of universe which is just deterministic and runs by itself, we don't actually have free will there either. And so if, if that's an issue for you in trying to understand how it could even work, um, I actually don't think we're even on like negative ground. Like I think no other system truly has free will in the, in the sense where we have the complete autonomy to do whatever we want because we are by nature limited beings. Now there's more to think there, but it's just trying to compare. Um, I don't think it's like a, like a, a death stab to Christianity uh, if that's where some people are going with that. Just, yeah, that's what I'd add. Okay. Thank you for asking your question, and I'm sure it's a question shared by many, many mm. of the people in this room. Um, I just want to make sure we honour the other questions that have been asked as well, um, mm. as we're you know, fast running out of time. Mm. Um, mm. If you have a question from the floor, um, put your hand up and the, the runners will look for you, but I'll ask another one from the list while that happens. Um, can we talk about the reign of death and the reign of Christ? We've been mm. looking at that in our... Seminars. There's a couple of questions that relate to it. Um, and so maybe you'd like to start us off, Joash. Um, mm. But can you explain again why Christ's reign only begins at his resurrection? Um, didn't he always reign um, as, you know, being the son of or God the son? Um, and also thinking about how does death reign now? Um, does it still reign even though Christ reigns post-resurrection? Yeah, sense? yeah, thanks. Um, so speaking to that first question, um, why is it that in the 1 Corinthians passage, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, that Paul says that his reign begins at his resurrection, did he not always reign being a, a person of the Trinity? Um, ex excellent question. There's maybe like two ways to think through it. The first one is like thinking back to some, uh, thinking about the Old Testament and the type of rule and reign that we were expecting. So I think, I think Stuart's chatting a bit today about the type of, the type of, I guess, King was that? I don't know if this was in the first talk or something, but the type of king that we were expecting to come um, was one that would rule forever. And so, by nature of his resurrection from the dead, he now has a body that cannot perish. There's a sense which that shows how he can now rule forever. So that's one sense of it. Um, the second is like the, I think the obvious answer is that he puts death to death. I guess is the way to say it. Like he he kills and destroys death. Um, by being raised from the dead. And that is the great enemy of sin and death of, of God's people. And so um, only by his resurrection at that moment, that's when we see him truly reigning. Um, yeah, so that, that's maybe like one bit of the answer. The second bit, I think, was saying, like, how do those bits work together? Like, well, death still exists. Like, we clearly feel that, don't we? Our aging and our pains and our suffering. Um, well, I think that's why uh, maybe it was helpful to think about how um, Christ's resurrection is almost like a, a drawn-out thing, and there's a, there's there's time between um, Christ's resurrection and the resurrection that is to come, um, and in that kind of we might say the overlap of those ages, the old and the new, um, both those things are realities where we still die, which is very tragic, um, but we can truly say that Christ is reigning and there is life for us now. And so we live in this very strange in-between time where just both those realities are true, yeah. But the, the, the truth of it is, and, and very, very much so, is that Christ is reigning and death has been defeated. Um, I think Stu used an analogy once, uh, Monash, um, where like sin, or you can even say death is like a tiger and it's been declawed it, or defanged, I guess, both. You need both. Um, and it's just sitting there and it's just, well, can't do much to you. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it could hit you or something. But, um, <laughs> but just think of it, it can't do anything to you. It's, it's kind of still there and annoying and things like that, but it, it doesn't have its sting anymore. Another analogy that I've 
um, heard, which I think is useful, is um, at the end of a war, so just imagine the end of World War II, um, Victory Day happens, the war is declared over, but maybe it takes a while for the message to kind of get through to every little town and person. And so until people have, like the victory spreads um, in its impact, I guess, as people respond to the news that the war is over and need to submit to the the allies, was it? The, mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a victory and then there's the kind of total um, fullness of the victory mm. in its happening. Yeah. Mm. Um, question about following Jesus, and I think um, this has probably come up in both seminars and talks, but maybe especially talks, um, some of the implications of following Jesus doesn't mean um, giving up our own dreams and our goals. Um, questions about uh, can we live uh, a faithful life but also um, do other things, I guess, like do, achieve other goals and wishes, um, uh, seeking different, does being faithful mean we stop seeking different solutions and just trust in Jesus? Um, so kind of getting into the nitty gritty of what does it look like to follow Jesus as we live life um, in this overlap of the ages, I guess. Yeah, I, I could start. And, um, I, I could speak to that for a little bit. Um, so I studied med at Monash. And I think at the time when I first came to uni, I, I just I just didn't really understand what the world was about. And I, I was living for myself. And what that kind of looked like was not some sort of like hedonistic, like wanting to ex explore lots of experiences. It was more like, I'm gonna study really hard and get the best grades. And then I will hope one day that my name will be in a hospital wing. That, that was my goal. That's what I wanted. Um, and I worked hard to that end. And it was because I just wanted to live for myself. Like I wanted, I wanted, uh, I wanted to be known and, and recognized and respected. And those were my dreams and goals. And in some senses, like having now understood this great thing that's happened in the resurrection, that there's this, there's this new creation, um, I actually do have, I think I did have to put some of my old selfish dreams and goals to death. Like I actually had to put them away. But that didn't mean that I just like quit everything and that I didn't find uh, a need to study. But one thing that helped me was thinking, how does like my, um, I think Aaron said that, does it, how does my story fit into the grand narrative of, God's redemption plan, well, uh, well, maybe I should use my studies um, to serve people in, in other countries. That's what I wanted to do, or in Australia, who, who needed it. And so I studied not because I wanted to get my name on a hospital wing, because I wanted to be really good to serve the patients that I would um, I'll be having. And maybe um, by diligence and um, prayer, I would be able to share the gospel with them. So maybe that's an example of like how you can, some, some goals and dreams can continue and be um, fit into what God is doing. And some actually probably have to be put to death, I think. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, well, it's really, it's a really, really tricky one to answer. Cause I mean, I struggle with this myself because on the, on the one hand, definitely right. Pick up your cross, follow me. It's so clear. Uh, give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. That's for all Christians everywhere. Um, so it's unambiguous that following in Christ, and to me, I mean, it makes intuitive sense, right? I mean, Christ's Lordship has turned everything upside down. It's, it's, it's said, uh, this is the grand story that we all need to be part of, what Christ is doing in the world. And um, I've called you to be my disciple. So, uh, yeah. I'd be really concerned if a Christian wasn't wrestling with what to sacrifice, how much to sacrifice, what's a good sacrifice, what isn't. What, you know, I don't, like you, that's something you've got to wrestle with as a Christian. So, um, and his call on your life is absolute. So I think maybe a simple response would be just determined, just determined to, to read the Bible for all it's worth and just follow it with all your might and just go where it, just go where it flows, man. And if you're, you know, like you might have these dreams to be something and, and just read the Bible, pray. And if you think, you know what, I'm really feeling the tug to go, you know, to deepest, darkest Africa, just, just, yeah, just, <laughs> do it. <before> I, do. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just yeah. saying, I'm just saying, 
just with all your might, to the best of your knowledge, do everything that Christ Jesus asked you to do. Uh, like I've, it's, it's sort of a rough answer in a way, but I really think you've, you've just got to follow Jesus and make that, uh, you know, determined to do that, even if it hurts. Um, that has to be held against, though. Uh, it just, yeah, you d- we cannot fall into the error of demonising enjoying life. That's, that's the tricky bit. Um, so all things that we enjoy in creation that are not expressly... Um, uh, you know, described as being bad for us because they're sinful or destructive or something um, because of Christ's Lordship and his word and help us understand that, uh, should be received with thanksgiving as a good gift from God. Uh, and it does say, you know, that um, it's pretty funny because like, you know, in, in uh, Second Corinthians where Paul is really trying to get these other uh, Corinthian church to give money for the collection um, for Jerusalem, is that right? I think that's right. For the churches in Jerusalem, yeah. So. Um, he's really working hard on them. Come on, come on, give, give. You know, other people, other people have been really generous to you. You should give. And then he goes, yes, but we don't want it to be under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. So <laughs> it's like you know, I mean, it's, so so there is that sort of wrestle going on. Um, yep. So this is as good as I can do right now. It's excellent. It means that wrestling is good. So asking that question. Um, mm indicates there's probably some wrestling going on. And so mm. that's, that's yeah. actually really good. And it is hard because it's not going to look exactly the same for every single person. Mm. Um, there's no clear-cut um, three-minute question time answer. But I think that great principle of not holding back in um, trying to find a loophole, do I have to give up that thing for Christ? Mm. Uh, that kind of thing as well. Yeah, um, That's really helpful. Um, was there a question from the floor? The mic should work. I think it's at the bottom. Hi. Oh, hello. Oh, yeah. Hi. You're good. You're shy. Um, right. So uh, my question, I guess, uh, is, is just about something that hasn't been addressed yet. So it's just kind of, you know, bugging my mind a bit. Um, but this is with regards to like a little gap of, in, you know, like, so what happens after he's buried and his resurrection? So there's three days. And I feel like that would be like a huge piece of information that I would like to know what happened. What happened in those three days? Yeah. Um, so we went from the atonement. We didn't have a. We didn't have a. We didn't have a Saturday summit. <laughs> well, isn't that what one Corinthians fifteen said? He was buried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I was just, I was just making a joke. We didn't spend a whole year in it. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I, I think it's um, maybe not as super clear. Yeah, and, and not as much detail is given to it. And I, I think there's probably a reason for that. Um, you, I know, Ishan, you might be maybe referring to some of the like church creeds that might talk about the fact that he descended to the dead. Um, I, I think it's, I don't know, I'd love to hear what these guys think. Um, I'd love to wrestle with that more. And I think it's an area of theology that, yeah, might be underdeveloped. But I also think it isn't given as much detail and maybe there's something to that. Yeah. Maybe there's something to that fact. Yeah. Stu? Yeah. Look, um, very vulnerable moment here. I have to acknowledge my ignorance on that topic. I just haven't wrestled with what people have said about, like, theologically about that. Um, yeah. So, descended to hell? I don't think so, but I don't know why. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Candice, you've done probably more things on this, I don't know. Uh, oh, no, not heaps. I, I think the fact of resurrection raises the question of what happens in between, I think, um, because there's, there's an in-between. It's not like um, you just dissolve or you stop to exist or that kind of thing. So I think it's, it's a question that resurrection raises. Um, there's some interesting passages like 1 Peter 3 yeah. um, that you could have a look at. Um, and ponder that. And if you find an answer, let me know. Um, yeah, I I don't have a whole lot more to say on that either. Um, I'd be curious enough. Yeah. Like, we got yeah. some other dudes here who might have a thought. Who are you? Like, <laughs> as, as, as in, you're pointing to. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone's got any 
<laughs> well, we're, we're being very close to the end of our time, so we might yeah. um, ask you, uh, Ishan, you can talk to Dan King, who's sitting right next to you. You can have a chat about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah got to be down there. <laughs> he'll sort you out. Um, he'll sort you out. Um, it'd be a great thing to give a bit more time and thought to, I think, rather than just kind of make stuff up. Yep. Um, we are hitting the end of our time. I just want to finish on this question because it's helping us to think about heaven and so that's mm. a nice place to end, I think. Um, so the question is, um, how much of our earthly lives will we have or remember in particular, I think, in heaven? Um, so we looked at Isaiah 65 today about the old creation not being remembered, mm. um, but also people seeing about the lamb who was slain. So that happened in you know, yeah, yeah. this creation. Um, and his death is tied to his exaltation. So... Um, do we remember in a sense in order to celebrate or like what's, I guess there's maybe things that we can't know, yeah. um, but can you make some helpful comments about Yeah, that? yeah. We have actually talked about this oh, today because yeah. <laughs> like, how weird would it be if that was just taken so literally that you didn't remember and you just popped in and you were like, <laughs> where am I? Yeah, right, yeah. Like, uh, who are you? Right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, even who are you yeah, at that yeah. point? Like, um, <laughs> I, think, I think there's a... I think I think actually the questioner answered the question really well, right? There's a yeah. sense where clearly things that have happened, like the great victory of the Lamb, is re- is remembered. Um, um, but I think the verses um, you, you covered it today or yesterday in the seminars is maybe emphasising the idea that the the pain and the suffering that is that is experienced is um, either in some ways no longer remembered or not remembered with any hurt or regret and there's no sense in which in, in the new creation you look around and go oh this is um this is not as good as what it used to be yeah yeah i don't know yeah some thoughts yeah yeah i tell you i, th- I think you're yeah. not remembering is referring to uh the pain the groaning the suffering that'll be a dis a distant memory, not quite the same <laughs> words, but you know that's 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 the import of it. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's it's not something that bothers you uh, now, which is a lovely mm. hope, wonderful idea. Because that's yeah. that's a, that's a concern about the new creation mm. is that there will be this deep sadness over you because of uh, people who are not with us, mm. or because of just things so bad that have happened in this creation uh, that you feel like how could I never, how could I not be scarred by those things? But the only scar, to be poetic, but I don't want to be twee about it, but the only scars will actually be Christ's mm. scars. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Mm. Yeah. That perfect healing, yeah. perfect reconciliation with God, with each yeah. other. Yeah. yeah. We're not hindered by sin, yeah. by death anymore. And all of its effects and ugliness. Yeah. 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 Mm. And we will get there, we will get why God, why. There are some things we wrestle with. Mm. And we, really just, we really don't quite know why. And, and there we'll, we'll see it with clarity. Yeah. It's a great place to end. Um, how about I pray and we'll finish up. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, such big questions um, and so much that we don't know. And we do um, acknowledge our limitation and our, um, our lack. Um, we're so finite. Um, but you are not. Um, you know uh, everything Um, you are perfectly good Um, you revealed yourself to us in your son uh, who is gentle and lowly in the heart um, who gives rest for our souls we pray father um, in trust that uh, what you reveal about yourself um, in your son is true um, and that that's a safe place from which we can ask these questions and have these concerns um, even experience doubts, uh, knowing that um, we can come to you um, in safety on the basis of Jesus' blood shed for us. Um, Yeah, thank you that we've been able to wrestle with hard questions. Um, Thank you that you've given us each other. Um, Yeah, to um, walk the Christian life with. Um, Thank you that we don't do this alone um, and that we do this... um, yeah, indwelt by your spirit who is helping us and guiding us and growing us up in Christ um, to help us to trust and to help us uh, to grow in him. Uh, Father, we pray that we would continue um, not just here at Summit, um, but in all of our lives to um, dig deeply into your word, to read it slowly, um, to chew over it, um, 
to pray uh, through it, um, to let it sink in and to shape our thoughts and our feelings um, and our actions. Uh, Father, please um, help us in all of this. And we pray that as we do, we would see more and more of your goodness, your kindness, um, your great love um, and your glory uh, revealed to us in the Lord Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this Monash Christian Union Bible Talk. We long to see everyone at Monash University know a disciple-making disciple of Jesus Christ. If you have been blessed by this ministry and would love to support Monash Christian Union, you can do so via the link in the podcast description.